Okay, so to the main event. Um, very pleased to welcome back uh, David Hogg um, <laughs> here. Um, some of you will remember a previous visit. Um, David representing Horizon Imaging. Um, talked a lot about uh, drone and aerial photography last time, particularly. Something a bit different tonight, I believe. Um, so, without further ado, back to you. Right, thank you. Now I've got a. Right. I'm all mic'd up here. Right, well, thank you very much for having me along again. Um, I must have done something right the first time, otherwise you wouldn't have invited me back. Um, but yeah, it's good to be here, and this, tonight I'll be talking about a slightly different aspect of what I do in my own photography company, Horizon Imaging, which, as you probably guessed, is panoramic photography. Um, is it possible to turn the front lights yes. off? Oh, that's good. So we can all see that, okay, and I can still hold things up. Perfect, so um, I shall start. This is what I'll be covering this evening, so who am I? A lot of you know who I am already. Um, what is panorama photography? Why do it? What the key points are if you want to have a go yourself? What is a panorama head? Uh, how does stitching work? What is an HDR panorama? What is a spherical panorama? And how do you make a virtual tour? So that's in the next two hours. And I haven't timed the, I haven't timed the talk, so it could be done in half an hour. We could be here until midnight. Um, so, uh, who am I? Um, many of you know David Hogg. Um, I <coughs> live in Aldershot. I've been running my own photography company, Horizon Imaging, for the last two years or so, full time. And based in Aldershot, Hampshire, as I say, operate across the south of the UK. And I offer a number of different specialist, for, well, what I think is specialist photography services uh, drone, telescopic mast, architectural photography, virtual tours, and video production. So, I've talked a lot about drones at my last talk. Uh, this evening I'll be talking about virtual tours and the, te the technology that I use to create them. A bit of a background for me, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a keen model aircraft builder since I was about 12 in 1998. And that was the sort of, sort of thing I used to love building in my spare time when I had it. Uh, and then I progressed on to things that could take aerial photographs. So this was a uh, plane that I built, designed and built from scratch to carry a little um, camera that sat in a tiny aperture underneath the fuselage there. And with that, I took this photo of my school, Claremont Fancourt School in uh, Isher in Surrey. And that was back in 2006, and that's the first commercial type of photography that I did, although you couldn't really call it a business back then, because I took it and thought, oh, this is nice, and then approached the school and see if they wanted to buy it, which they did. Um, but they're still using it to this day, and I still regret not asking to have a, you know, a, a, a license period after which they pay me more, because I think that would have been a nice little earner otherwise. <laughs> but, um, you know, that's what really set me going on the idea of doing commercial photography. Um, but it took me until April 2014 to actually decide to make a go of it full time because uh, you know, it's, it's quite a step from having... My background is engineering and I worked as an engineer full time for about five years, had a regular income, was quite comfortable with that and the idea of going and starting my own photography business was a bit daunting. But yeah, I'm still here two years later and it's just um, taking off. <laughs> Ah, that's, that, you'll be glad to know that's the only animation that I'll be using this evening. <laughs> so, on to panorama photography. So, what is it exactly? Um, I looked it up in a dictionary. Uh, a panorama could be an unbroken view of the whole region surrounding an observer, or a picture or photograph containing a wide view. So, it's a bit of a fluffy um, definition, really. So, would you call this a panorama, for example? Or would you call that a panorama? Um, this was actually a very wide view, stitched together from multiple images, but you know you could have taken that with a normal wide-angle lens. Um, what I'll be talking about this evening is this side of the screen, where we take multiple pictures and stitch them together. <coughs> stitched imagery. So, um, since even just since I was last here, the, the development of um, software in mobile phones has allowed everyone to become a panoramic photographer if there is such a job title. Um, and the, I'm not really going to cover how to use mobile phone apps because that's really very simple. Um, so the, the topic of the talk is about how to take photographs with your own equipment, you know, SLRs, whatever you have, and 
stitching them together to... Uh... <laughs> and on to the next slide. <laughs> so, why do it? Um, a lot of you might uh, familiarise yourself with this situation, where you want to take a shot of Big Ben and then realised you couldn't do it all in one photograph, or the Eiffel Tower or something. Um, so basically, you've been on holiday somewhere, you've seen a beautiful landscape or cityscape, and that's all you've been able to capture with the lens that you've had on your camera. Um, and yeah, so the basic problem is your lens isn't wide enough. Now, this could be for several reasons. Uh, it could be that you left your wide-angle lens at home, which happened to all of us, um, or your significant other won't allow you to spend any more money on photography equipment, <laughs> so you can't buy a wide-angle lens or you can't convince your significant other that a wide-angle lens would be really useful on your next holiday for capturing landscapes. So, um, or, more practically, you can't move back from uh, a subject to get a whole scene in the picture. So you're up against a wall, or you're at the edge of a cliff and you can't move any further, uh, or you'd fall off. Um, or, and these are sort of separate to these problems, you want to take a 360-degree photograph or a spherical, pan, a spherical photograph, which is what I'll talk about later. So image stitching can solve all of your problems, um, or at least the ones we've just talked about there on the left. Um, so in the olden days, and this was quite fun, I discovered this in my um, collection of old film photographs a while ago, um, that is how you might have made a panorama um, about 10 years ago, perhaps. Uh, this was taken, gosh, it must be more than 10 years ago, with a little film compact disposable. It wasn't disposable, actually. You could put a film in it, but that was about as advanced as it got. So, you know, that was fun at the time, but now there are so many different bits of uh, hardware that you can buy, software that you can use, and that's just one example of a panorama I took ages ago. That's actually the house of the composer Grieg, um, who lived in Norway. Um, that was, yeah, gosh, about, I can't remember, when did we go to Norway? About eight years ago. Yeah, a long time ago. So the idea of taking these panoramas, again, like the drone photography, is something that I just investigated out of the fun of it. Um, and it's only now that I've added it as a, an arm of my commercial uh, business. So stitching is a big part of how the process works. So you've obviously got the hardware that you take the, the pictures with, and then you have the software that does all the clever stitching it together. And despite the wide range of software that you can get to do the stitching, the process is very, very similar across all of them. So you basically start with a load of images, um, taken in any, no particular order, doesn't matter how many of them there are, and you throw it into the software, and the software will look at all the images very quickly and look for um, features that can be matched between adjacent photographs. Uh, I still find it a bit of a black magic that it works at all, because if you imagine having to precisely uh, line up all of these images, undistort them, correct the brightnesses and um, colour tones across all of them, uh, it's, it's just phenomenal how quickly uh, modern computers can do that. Um, so you can see here, this is a what <laughs> if you use the, the sellotape and print stick method, that's what you would end up with. Um, but what the software then does is that it look, goes through those images and blends the differences in brightness and colour tone, and so you end up with something that looks seamless like that. And that's really the result that we're going to be talking more about this evening. Is it possible to open a window in here? It's a bit warm. Or is it just me? Am I already overheating? <laughs> Thank you. So that's the, the basic process, and there are quite a few key points that if you want to do it yourself, you need to follow to make sure that your stitching is a success. Firstly and foremostly is manual exposure. Um, although the software is very clever in balancing and adjusting contrast and brightnesses, if you imagine you had your camera set on auto and you were doing a, a, a very wide panorama, the sun was on one side and the sh dark shadow, shadowy side of a building was on the other side. If you had it on auto, the camera would really underexpose the shot looking at the sun because it thinks it's really bright, and then it would overexpose the shadowy part. But because... Um, panoramas are made from stitched images, you need to have the same exposure across all of them, otherwise it's going to look a bit 
weird, and there is a limit to how well the camera can blend the images when they're stitched together. So manual exposure, meaning constant aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Uh, and manual white balance, it's not so critical, but again, if you can have the settings correct in, in the camera first, it's going to make the processing that much easier. And manual focus, again, you don't want to be changing what you're focused on as you're doing the panorama. Uh, I've put disable any lens stabilization because in the nature of how a lens stabilizes an image is it has an element inside that moves around and so that can fractionally you know, change the, the way the image looks so it's best to turn that off when you're taking the pictures. And ideally use a tripod and a shutter release or a timer. <coughs> Um, you don't have to do it, and if you're only doing a two-shot panorama, then you can just sort of handhold it and be, be careful, and you know, the, the result's are usually fine. These, this level of um, accuracy is needed when you're doing spherical panoramas and more complicated ones where you've got lots of images to stitch together. Um, because whilst the software can, is very good at lining up pictures that have been correctly taken, if you know, you took one picture like this and then you sort of moved over here and took the other one like this, you're going to get what are called parallax errors, which means they won't line up no matter how clever the software is because the, the, the way the scene is uh, captured has changed between the two positions. And this is something I'll come on to a little later, a panorama head. This is something that, again, helps you to capture the pictures very accurately and precisely, particularly if you're doing spherical panoramas. Um, overlap the images by about 20%. Basically, the software needs to be able to look at both images and see and look for the um, features that are the same across both. So, if you didn't give it any overlapping, it wouldn't know. You know it wouldn't know that they were still related. Um, lens choice isn't critical, and it depends what you're wanting to do with the final pictures. So, a spherical panorama. Um, if you want it to have good resolution and you can zoom in and out, you will need either a high, de a high resolution camera body and a, a wide angle lens, or if you've only got a low resolution camera, then you just take more pictures but with a narrower field of view. So you get the same end result and it depends what you're wanting to, to do with the images. But essentially, if you've got a 18 megapixel camera, you take two 18 megapixel pictures and overlap them, you'll probably end up with a 30 megapixel picture or something. So actually taking panoramas is not just about getting everything in the field of view. Um, if you're wanting to, I don't know, say print a, print a picture that covers the whole length of a wall and you want to, I don't know, capture a cityscape to do so, it's using this technology and this software is a very good way of making a, a very high resolution picture with a low resolution camera. Um, and in fact, you can take that to the extreme of using something like a two or three hundred millimeter lens and taking a hundred or even you know, several hundred photos of a scene, stitching it together, and you end up with what's called a gigapixel panorama, which as you can imagine has lots of pixels in it. And you can print it at huge sizes, or you can use a web-based uh, interface and zoom you know, right in on the details. And there, there's a whole... Um, not craze, but you know, a lot of people do this and there are websites specifically for hosting these massive files that you can then you know, explore and interrogate in your own, at your own time. Um, so, Panorama Head, uh, I'll be focusing quite a lot on what this is for and uh, why it's needed. Um, as, it, as I said earlier, the, the subject of this talk is about really creating high resolution and ultimately spherical panoramas where you can look around in all directions. Um, so panorama head, basically, there's a point in a camera and lens assembly where the, the rays of light from the uh, scene that you're photographing will cross over before they then uh, end up on the sensor. And the point where they cross is called the entrance pupil. Um, pupil, I guess, from, you know, we have a pupil in our eye, I guess. Um, so basically to capture pictures with a camera that will overlap perfectly, no matter how you're moving the camera, you need to rotate the camera about that point in every uh, axis. Um, so it's where the rays of light cross over before they hit the sensor. And if you don't rotate the camera about this point, then if you try and stitch the pictures together, 
then you'll have stitching problems. Uh, and every camera and lens combination will have a different location of the entrance pupil, uh, something I'll go and, and talk about shortly. So the panorama head is basically designed to rotate the camera about this point. Uh, some of them are designed to work with any type of camera lens setup. Uh, others are, usually the homemade ones, tend to be built for a particular uh, camera and lens combination. So this one pictured here is actually one I made myself, who <laughs> goodness knows how many years ago now, and it was for a Canon 40D and a 10 to 22 millimeter lens, and it actually worked, worked pretty well. And I even included um, little detents, so stops, where, so I knew that it was pointing in the right direction every time I took the picture. Uh, it was made of wood and um, bits of old you know, metal and screws that I found lying around. But that shows that the, the concept is quite easy, and I think I've got a picture of an even more basic one on the next slide. Um, but that's what the panorama head does. It just rotates the camera around this, um, this entrance pupil. So two axes of rotation, and most are customizable, and some have detents, so that you, can, you know that you're, you've rotated the camera exactly by 90 degrees or whatever. Um, so where can I get one from? This isn't the sort of thing that you can get in high street shops usually, because the demand is relatively low. Uh, but there are, as with any product these days, specialists online that only deal with this type of equipment. One is reddoor.co.uk. I have no idea why it's called that. But they have a really good range of um, equipment from the sort of budget end right up to really expensive electronic automated stuff for doing gigapixel panoramas. Um, in terms of what products are available, the, this Panasaurus is, uh, is one of the most popular uh, low-end ones. It's made of plastic. It's got, it's fully customizable, so you can use any, diff you know, you can adjust it to work with your lens and camera combination. But being plastic, it's maybe a bit flexible. Maybe it can't deal with the heavier lens camera combinations. Um, but it's, you know, under 100 pounds, so it's not, it doesn't hurt the wallet too much. Um, there are many different makes in between, um, but our Nodal Ninja is a very well-known brand, and that's the one that I've got on my tripod here. And I think that was about three, 350 pounds, but it's beautifully engineered. It's all cut, um, milled out of aluminium. Um, it's very, very customizable. And you know, the, I've got a Canon 7D and a 815mm uh, fisheye zoom on there, which is quite a heavy um, combination but the, the, the panorama head holds it very, very securely, um, just so you can see how it works. Um, so you've got two dials that you can loosen. Uh, one does the horizontal movement, and you can just about hear, you can hear it clicking, and that's at the, the detents, so that's where I want it to stop when I'm taking the pictures. And likewise, it's got detents in this direction as well. So the... Uh, entrance pupil of this combination is about at the end of the lens here. So you can see as you move it around, that's exactly where the camera is being ro rotated around. And this lens is actually quite unique in that most zoom lenses, when you zoom in and out, the position of the entrance pupil actually changes. <coughs> Whereas with this lens, I don't know if they did it deliberately, um, the entrance pupil stays in the same place. So with the same setup, you can either do, um, it's about six pictures in total, so you do four at 90 degree intervals, horizontally. You do one up and one down, and then that covers the whole field of view. Or if you zoom in from eight to 15 mil, then I haven't tried it, but you probably need double the number of pictures. But you'll end up with a panorama with you know, almost double or perhaps more resolution. So it depends what you need. But this, because this is an 18 megapixel camera, you, you know, when you stitch six of these images together, the, the resolution is 40 or 50 megapixel, and it's more than adequate for most applications. Um, most of these things will just go on a, a website. It might be for a virtual tour for... Um, I'll show you later, actually, an example I did uh, of a student accommodation facility in London, and it's just something that, you know, guests to the website can click and view and, you know, jump between rooms and just get a feel of what the site is like, so you don't need a gigapixel panorama for that. That would just be a waste of um, hard drive space. <laughs> do, you, do you adjust that um, for your camera and lens combination to match the lens that you're using? 
don't worry about the yeah, don't, don't worry about the microphone. Um, so the, the question was, do you, do you need a different panorama head for different cameras? Yeah, yeah so um, with this setup, the nodal ninja of the Panasaurus, you don't. Um, so it's, it's probably easier to look at it afterwards, but there are, um, you can maybe see here that there are, there are rails, and there are actually rulers in, um, indicated on the side. And basically, if you, this, knob here just loosens the camera and allows you to take it off. Um, but there's another little smaller knob here which actually sets uh, an end stop. So I've calibrated this to work with this lens and camera combination, but for a diff different combination you just undo that and work out you know, where you need to set it for a different combination. And so this can work with any number of different uh, lens camera combinations. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's not something you'd um, you would see unless you looked for it, <laughs> I suppose. Um, because, as I say, you won't see it in high street camera shops. Um, certainly, certainly these higher end models. Um, but as I say, if you're only doing you know two or three shot panorama or even more, you know, provided you remember this thing about the entrance people. So if you're you know, you don't have your tripod with you and you want to take a, a wide panorama, instead of going like this, try and sort of do it like, more like this, so you're keeping the centre of the camera roughly, even if you don't know where the entrance pupil is. Yeah, that will, that will help, certainly, yeah. Um, but even um, depending on um, the, the, the occasions where you get the most problems with stitching panoramas is if you've... Uh, landscapes are fine. You will very, very rarely have problems. It's if you're in, a, in the middle of a building and you've got lots of things near the camera, further away from the camera, and that's where being precise about how you're taking it will help. So even if you've got it on a tripod, tripods will generally rotate the camera around this sort of point. Um, and if you were doing, you know, you were in the middle of a, I don't know, a market or something, and you took lots of pictures, you, you may struggle with stitching errors. Um, it depends on how precise you want to be about these things, but um, to answer your original question, these are designed to work with multiple uh, setups. Okay. Uh, does anyone else have any questions before I move on? No? Okay. Um, so yeah, just the last slide about the homemade design. So there's a, another even more crude wooden one. And you can see how it works. You know, the person that's made it has made sure that this bolt is directly underneath the lens at uh, the entrance pupil, and then the pivot, pivot in this axis also passes through the same point. Uh, and there's a picture of the one here, which uh, you can welcome to have a look at later. Ah, good question. So I'm going to come on to how you set this up to find where the entrance pupil is. Um, in fact, it's the very next slide. <laughs> so, there are websites where people have created databases of where the entrance pupils are for many different lens camera combinations, and generally, um, they've got most cameras and lenses in there these days. Um, so that's one which I, I can forward that link on to everyone. I think those two terms are interchangeable, entrance pupil and nodal point. Um, from what I know, entrance pupil is the, the more common one. Um, but, yeah, it's the, so long as it's describing that this, this point where you need to rotate the camera around. Uh, so that's a very good website. That has the, the Canon 7D and that lens on it, for example. Um, but if your camera lens isn't on there for some reason, then you will need to measure, measure, measure the following dimensions of your camera lens setup yourself. So there are four dimensions. Firstly, there's the base plate. Um, maybe I can show you here. So the base plate where you screw the camera to the tripod up to the center of the sensor, um, which you can probably do by taking the lens off, looking at the front, and gauging where the center is. Uh, then on the bottom, between the tripod mounting hole and the front 
face of the lens mount. So it's the, the surface that the lens touches when you, when you mount it. Uh, from the same surface on the lens to the entrance pupil. This is assuming you know the entrance pupil, and I will talk about what you do if you don't know it. Uh, and then finally the tripod hole to the centre of the lens barrel if it isn't already in line. So some cameras have the tripod hole off centre, as you can see there. Um, so if, if your setup isn't on that database, then, and actually, even though these dimensions are on the database, they're not always completely accurate, and you will need to do some fettling and fiddling to get it exactly right, and that's what I had to do when I set this system up on the, the head. So you just need to find two objects, one close to the camera and one far away, um, ideally vertical lines, because you're going to look for a, a change in um, the, the parallax, it's called. So ideally, being right next to a door frame here and then having another door frame a long, long way away is good. And I'll show a picture of that shortly. And basically, you're going to rotate the camera about different points along the lens barrel until you minimize the change in perspective. Um, so this is an even older wooden panorama head that I made for an old uh, Canon PowerShot A620 before I had an SLR. Um, and that giant thing on the front was a wide-angle converter, um, which was as close as I could get to an interchangeable lens camera with my budget at the time. And this strange collection of pictures is basically what I described. So this pale thing here is a door, the edge of a door looking, that you're looking at. And then uh, I think this thing here, where it goes from dark to light, that's another door frame down a corridor. So this is four sets of results. And just to explain it a bit more, this image would be taken when you've pointed your camera so that this, these two door edges is at the leftmost side of the image that you've taken. So I'm not sure if I can explain that very clearly. So imagine you've got the doors here. You take a picture like from here and then you rotate the camera and take another picture with this same combination on the right hand side. And that's what you're looking at here. And you can see if this camera setup was held at the tripod mount, so I was holding it way down here at the bottom, so like this, you can see that there was a difference in these two distances. And basically you're going to look for the position along here where the differences in these distances are the same. And I know that's a lot to digest, so I will <laughs> I'll happily um, write a better explanation and email it to you all if, uh, if you're interested. But basically, that's the, the problem that you're trying to reduce. Because you can see here quite clearly that that looks different to that. And that's just by moving the camera on the head. So if you've got lots of pictures where you've got you know, more scenery visible in one picture than you have in another, then the, the software is going to struggle to stitch it together. And basically, once you've fiddled around, so it's only two things that you're going to be changing. It's how far the camera is mounted this way on this rail, and when it's mounted like that. Shall screw this back on because I'm afraid of dropping it. And then the other distance you're going to be changing is in this direction, moving it this way. Actually, a tip for finding this, um, the correct setting this way is if you look at how that's moving, the, the camera is, well, the, the lens is cylindrical, so the, the center of the lens is in the middle of the cylinder, and it's looking directly down, and I think that's why they do it, on a little sort of crosshair target pattern there. So the easiest way to get this setting right is just to um, put the camera in live view mode, or you know, if, if your camera has it, and then just rotate it around like this and look to make sure that the 
Um, there you go. Make sure this little target stays bang in the middle, because if you imagine doing it like that and wiggling it around, you're going to see this little target moving all over the screen. Um, I'll happily demonstrate that to you, um, maybe in the break, because it's quite a difficult uh, concept to describe. Um, but that's basically how you find the, the, the entrance pupil in those two axes. So how do I do the stitching? So you've taken all your pictures the best you can, now what do you do with them? So, as I mentioned earlier, there are many different packages of software that you can use for stitching the images together. Um, Photoshop will do a good job, um, and there are many, many, many others, but the one I use for my work, and it's been around for a long time, is called PT GUI. Nice and memorable. Uh, it actually stands for Panorama Tools, which is the open source project that created the Entrance Pupil database. And they then put together a software a graphical user interface, GUI, and so they called it PT GUI, which doesn't really stick in the mind very well, but hey-ho. And it's been around for many years. It continually is being updated with new features, and you know they're making it faster and faster, and it's just, just phenomenal how quickly it will stitch the images together um, in the, the newer versions. So... Basically, PT GUI has very fast auto-alignment, so you just throw all your images at it. It could be two, it could be 200, and it will do all the searching for you, and provided you've overlapped things properly and you haven't got big stitching errors, it will immediately spit out something like this, and you can then tweak and adjust that um, as, as an if is, uh, if is required. Um, it's an easy-to-use interface, but then I suppose everything is once you've got used to it. Um, <laughs> Maybe it's not easy to use, and I've just got used to it, I don't know. Um, and it has many different, uh, it supports many different types of stitching. So one thing that surprised me when I first discovered it in the, in the software, before I knew what a spherical panorama was, is that it's all very well taking a row of photos like this, but you might want to capture a row above it and a row below it to get you know, a really big scene in one picture. And this will do that no problem, because at the end of the day, it's only looking for similar features in the images and the fact that you could have um, four images how do, I, how do I explain it four images, these two overlap <coughs> these two overlap and these two also overlap the bottom two it will pick out the identical features and it will realise that you've done two rows together and quite how it works I don't know but I just know that it does um, and, yeah, gigapixels, so if you put enough high-resolution images into it, you can output a vast you know, image of 100,000 pixels across and jam up your computer's hard drive very quickly. Um, and also HDR support, which is something I'll talk about brief, um, a, bit, a bit later, um, where you can actually do multiple exposures and stitch the images together, which is, becomes very powerful. Um, manual control points basically means that if the software, for some reason, couldn't marry up the images, you can tell it, look here, this, this point on this image is meant to match up with this point on this image. And I rarely have to do that, but if you've got a scene where you know, people are moving about, perhaps, and you've got something that... Uh, maybe is in one image but then gets obscured in the next image, then you can actually manually go in and tell the camera, tell the software how it should be doing the blending, which is very powerful. Um, it's got advanced, advanced stitching control as well, uh, which is something I hope to demonstrate later. Um, and a wide range of projection styles, which is the output end. So it could just be, you know, two pictures stuck together like that, and that's all you want. But you can do all sorts of interesting things with it, like these, which you may have seen, uh, which are called little planet <laughs> panoramas. So that is effectively a spherical panorama where you could look in any direction, but it's been projected in a different way. So this is straight under the camera. Um, straight above the camera is actually in a ring right around the edge of the picture. And then this is your horizontal view. When you, can <coughs> you can imagine standing in that field, you just have this little strip of interest on the horizon, loads of grass underneath you and just a, a white sky above you. So that's, again, the same uh, input imagery, but you can do different things with it. How do you avoid getting the uh, tripod shot? 
Ah, that's a good question um, about how to avoid getting the tripod in the shot, because you're quite right. If you take a picture like this, you'll have a tripod in the bottom. So that's something I'll come on to shortly. And it boils down to, um, well, there are several ways of doing it. You can either do click, <laughs> and then you have to um, you know, cut, cut the picture out in Photoshop and do lots of manual um, work. Or, and I only discovered this quite recently, if you've got, it might not work actually on this floor because there's, there's very little pattern, um, but this is one of the powerful features of PT GUI. If you know the footprint of the tripod, so you know which area needs to be free of tripod in the final picture, so, you know, there's a triangle here. If you move the camera away like this and then just take, you know, it doesn't have to be, this is where it really doesn't have to be precise. Take another picture like that. You can then tell PT GUI, um, now let me rewind a bit, the floor that you're taking the picture on will generally be flat. And if you imagine you're looking at something flat like this business card, if you look straight down on it, it will look rectangular. If you look at it sort of like this, it will look, you know, like a trapezium or some distorted in some way. You can tell PT GUI in the advanced settings that this shot that you took from over here is actually not part of the original panorama. And if you're lucky and it can detect enough features of what was around the tripod in this picture, it will then see, ah, oh, that goes over there. And it will distort the picture appropriately to cover the hole in the bottom. And that, when it works, makes things really simple because, as you can imagine, taking uh, the shot with the tripod in the bottom and you know, doing, taking another picture and then in Photoshop trying to make your new picture blend with the original is very time consuming. But that's how I used to do it before I realized this, it had this feature. Um, and it becomes particularly important if you're doing what I'll talk about next, I think, which is HDR panoramas, where you're taking multiple exposures. And it just simplifies things enormously by having the software do the hard work for you. Um, let me see. Is that what's next? Oh, yes. Um, so many of you will have heard of HDR photography, high dynamic range. Uh, for those of you who haven't, it basically means taking several exposures from very dark to very bright and using software to compress the apparent range of tones together. And the resulting image, you can go mad and make it look all you know, very whizzy and with all sorts of funky colors and contrast. Or, and that's what I do with my architectural photography, is it makes the resulting image more like what the human eye sees. Because if you're standing in a house, in a you know, dimly lit room and you've got a bright day outside, to your eye, you don't see the windows as being all white and burnt out. But the camera, because it has a limited uh, dynamic range, will not be able to process detail outside as well as inside. So you'll see in some of the uh, panoramas I show later, that's where it re you really benefit from doing HDR panoramas instead of just single exposures. If you're just doing it outside, then it's you know, generally fine. But uh, it's when you're in more challenging environments that it really does help. Um, and the pro version of PT GUI, which is a bit more expensive than the, the basic version, I think the basic version is about 70 or 80 pounds, just to give you an idea. Um, I think the pro version is maybe double that, and it has a couple of extra features as well. Um, so this, for example, is a an image that I'll show you later. It's part of this accommodation block in, in London that I did. And it explains, or it shows off the, the situation that I just described. You've got a very bright window. That's actually the sun there, so you're looking straight into the sun. Um, all the areas that the sun is hitting are very bright, and yet you've got dark corridors, dark ceiling, shadow areas, very dark corridor there. And this is an HDR um, image, and this is the full 360-degree spherical image projected into, it's called a rectilinear, no, it's not, an equirectangular image. Um, and so this is looking straight down, this is looking straight up, 
and yeah, that's everywhere, everywhere else in between. But if you'd taken that using just single exposures going all the way around, that window would have probably been white. Um, you wouldn't have seen much detail in the floorboards. Or if you had exposed for the bright bits, then the, the corridor would have just been black. So that gives you an idea of the advantage of doing HDR photography in general, not, not necessarily for um, taking panoramas. Um, and you just use the exposure bracketing mode on the camera to take more than one shot automatically for you. So it looks different on different cameras. This is what it looks like on a Sony. Um, and this means take a bracket in continuous shooting mode. So you hold the button down. It will take all three or have many images uh, straight after one another. Um, 3.0 is the number of stops brighter and darker than the normal image that it will take. And three is the number of images it'll take. So it'll take correctly exposed three stops under, three stops over. And usually, because you don't want to be holding your finger on the <laughs> camera when you do it, you can usually also use the two second timer as well. So you can press it, walk away, get out of the way of the shadow, which may well be there of you. <laughs> And then it'll take a quick succession of three, five, however many images um, you want. Three is usually enough. That was done with three. And I think that was done with plus or minus three stops. So the very dark image gives you the detail in the very bright areas of the image. So outside the bits where the sun's hitting. And then the plus three um, stop images gives you burnt out everywhere else but detail in the shadow areas. Um, and yeah, so very little detail would have been retained outside without using HDR techniques. And you might ask, hang on, you told me earlier to use manual exposure and have everything set. Basically what it will do is, it doesn't really matter if the shutter speed is changing between the images. What you want to maintain is ideally the ISO because then that sets the amount of noise that you have in the image, I suppose. The aperture you want to stay constant because that's setting your depth of field. But the shutter speed doesn't really matter because you're on a tripod. So if you're in manual mode, where normally every uh, camera setting is constant, if you go into the menu and tell it you want a bracketed exposure, it will know, cleverly, that you don't mind the shutter speed changing. There may be a setting where you can say, but I want the shutter speed the same, change my ISO instead. Um, but all the, the shots that I'll show you here were done where the shutter speed was changing. So constant aperture, constant ISO, and the shutter speed, well, I'm going to hopefully demonstrate how to take a spherical panorama later, but it all may go horribly wrong. Um, so if I set this, uh, so that will take, oh, it's turned off uh, bracketing. So the middle exposure is a fifteenth of a second. Fifteenth uh, of a second, F9, ISO 400, plus, plus, minus three stops is 125th of a second. And then in the other direction, uh, it's half a second. So that's the range of um, shutter speeds to get those, to get that six stop range of different brightnesses. And it can get complicated if you've got people moving in the scene. So there's one external panorama I'll show you, which was a busy street scene. And that's when it gets a bit difficult doing HDR photography if you need to do it. Because as quick as the camera can will take the three different exposures, you'll have things moving in it. So yeah, it gets tricky then. And actually, the, the uh, examples I'll show you later when I was doing inside work, there were people sort of moving in their seats or they've just looked down and they looked up and then when it blends it all together you'll get a sort of blurry mush <laughs> which isn't very useful um, and in that case you just have to do a bit of manual tweaking afterwards so you perhaps take the the correctly exposed image cut a bit out of it and superimpose that on the stitched result um, so I've mentioned this quite a few times already, uh, what a spherical panorama is. So if you take enough pictures to cover looking in every direction, 
then, and I found these graphics, I don't know if that helps explain it, <laughs> you can basically create a 360 degree, um, 180 degree floor to ceiling panorama where you can look in any direction. Um, for anyone that's used Google Street View um, will know that's essentially what this is. Um, and I'm going to now hopefully show you what this looks like. Uh, mm -mm. So this was and still is the only commercial uh, virtual tour that I've produced for a client because it's not really my main line of business that I've been pushing. That's m really the drone stuff. But um, it was a nice story. I was up in London photographing with my telescopic mast on the roof of a building, um, photographing an area of uh, buildings that was going to be developed. And I was shooting for a client that wanted to have an aerial view and also he wanted to see what the London skyline looked like from 50 foot above this existing building because that's where the new building, that's how high it would be. So I was taking these pictures for him, I was discussing it with him afterwards and I had my car, we were standing next to my car and on the back it said drone, mast, architectural, virtual tours, video production and then the owner of the neighbouring building which was this student accommodation block said oh, well, you do virtual tours do you? And that's the first and only time so far that someone's actually looked at what's written on my vehicle and tweaked. And um, yeah, so that's made it worth having <laughs> writing on my vehicle. Um, so then we got in touch and basically they have several sites across London and they wanted, uh, they were redoing their website and they wanted a way for potential uh, students or people that wanted to stay there to have a look around, see what it looks like, um, get a bit more of an idea of the surroundings than you could get with still photos. So this whole thing is what I've produced for them. And a virtual tour is essentially lots of spherical panoramas taken in different locations and married together with ways of jumping between the panoramas. Um, I'll show you this and then it's probably time for a tea break. Um, so this, I think there are about five or six different uh, hotspots locations and I'll just show you briefly how you can explore uh, a virtual tour like this. So this is the street scene that I was talking about and as you can imagine trying to do an HDR picture here would be just a waste of time <laughs> because of all these things that are moving the people, the cars um, and so you can see you can look all the way up to the sky, uh, you can look down to the, the pavement, there's no tripod there and had I done that manually stitching it, uh, manually doing it in Photoshop, that would have been an absolute pain because of all the delicate detail in the, the shadows. But um, the technique I'll show you later with PT GUI make, made it really simple. Um, so you can look around and then you think, oh, what, what's this here? Um, I, I think it's something to do with how it's being projected. Normally the, the, you get a pop-up saying uh, reception when you hover over that. Um, or you can use this map interface that I made. So I got them to give me a floor plan of the, the site. And again, not quite sure why it's not showing it on here, um, because it is on here. Um, when you hover over these hotspots, it'll say, you know, reception, bedrooms, lounge, whatever. And so you can either click on here, or you can click on these uh, feet here and that will take you into the new location. So it's anyone that's used Google Street View, it's just like, like that, but it's a lot more um, bespoke. So in Street View, you're limited to having a little arrow on the floor for what you want to go further down the road in that direction. Whereas here, I can put these hotspots anywhere that I like. I can also put um, additional information, like there's a little camera symbol here, if you click on that, it can display a picture, a video, it can play some sound. If you want to get really clever, it can play localized sound. So if, you, if you're looking at this and you've got stereo speakers on your computer, you could have, I don't know, some chatter coming out of the speakers at you. And then if you look over here, 
you'll suddenly hear the chat has gone off to your right somewhere. Um, so it's really very, very powerful software. Um, and again, no, no tripod on the bottom, but my logo and, or the logo of the hotel and my logo as well. There. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, so this is a good example of an environment where there's such a, a wide range of a wide dynamic range that if you imagine these windows will be very very bright, um, and then you've got very dimly lit areas as well. So taking one picture here, you'd really struggle to get detail in both the, the bright and the dark areas. Um, let's just use the map interface quickly. So let's jump to one of the bedrooms. Um, Oh, there's a little camera up there. If you click that, it's, it shows you a bit more information about it. Um, it's quite clever. These are bunk beds that can actually move up and down to make the most of the space, which is quite clever. Um, I, presumably, you're not meant to put it up if someone's sleeping on the top one. <laughs> <laughs> Although, being student accommodation, I'm sure that's probably been done. Um, you can also display it in a, a row of icons like this. So, yeah, it's just it's very powerful software, and this is just my interpretation of how to create a tour. And it's fully, you can make it fully responsive, so you can look at it on a, a computer, a tablet, a smartphone, or whatever, and it will scale um, correctly. So, that's probably a good point to stop, um, and I've already covered that as well, so that's what a virtual tour is. So, after the break, I'm going to try and take a spherical photo, a spherical photo panorama here and actually run through how I do the stitching so that you can see what the process involves. Um, that's the plan anyway. So thank you very much and let's have some tea. Right. Um, Um, yeah, that's, I think that's, that's fine as it is. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, right, so this is the interesting bit. This is where I'm going to try and demonstrate how to take a spherical panorama, and in the stress of the situation, I might forget. So, um, so this is all set up um, correctly. We've got the camera mounted onto the frame in the right position. Um, so let's put it here. So I'm going to initially set the, uh, actually, first I'm going to make sure the tripod's level, because that always helps. There's a little bubble level on here, which makes that uh, nice and straightforward. Um, so the first thing is to set the bracketed exposure so that it's, it's sensible, so that the very bright covers what I need it to, and the very dark is, is also correct. Um, also I'm going to set the white balance manually. Um, what you'll see is that I, take, I shoot everything in RAW and then I take the images initially into Lightroom and the only adjustment I do is to remove the chromatic aberration, the purple fringing around the edges um, because that just annoys me. And <laughs> so you remove it in, in Lightroom. I actually do, um, I tell a lie, I actually adjust the highlights and uh, shadows in there as well because a raw file you can extract detail from the highlights and the shadow areas so I boost the shadows, I reduce the highlights and then I export the images um, and then I'll throw them into PT GUI. So and that's even though I'm still doing an HDR you can actually extract even more data by doing the three exposures and then processing the raw files as well. Um, Have you tried the HDR in Lightroom? Um, no, I didn't know there was one. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so because PT GUI does all the stitching um, and it also has the mode for doing the HDR panorama as well, um, I tend to do all that in PT GUI and I just use Lightroom for doing this basic editing. Um, so let's get the white balance set up. So that's what, what I was saying about the, the white balance. 
it's a good idea to set it manually to r limit the amount of change between the images, but if you're shooting in RAW, you can always adjust the white balance afterwards um, in Lightroom. Um, so this is set to 8 millimeters, what it is now. <laughs> um, and 8 millimeters, which is very wide, on this camera actually gives you a, a you can actually see the image circle, so it's, you know, it's so wide that it's not actually covering the whole of the sensor. Um, but you can see, um, and that's something that you work out as soon as you get the setup on your tripod, uh, the panorama head, is how many pictures you need to take to cover the whole um, sphere, if you like, with overlap. So I've worked out that I can take four pictures 90 degrees apart and because this is almost 180 degree fisheye, I can already see at the bottom of this picture the tripod. So there's almost no need to take the shot looking straight down. Um, but obviously the quality of the image right at the edge of the circle is going to be the, a bit blurry. It's not, it's not going to be the best. So I take four shots at 90 degrees apart. Then I swivel it, take a shot looking down, a shot looking up. Although there's there's very little pattern up there, so I could probably get away with that. Um, so let's set the... So I'll just quickly autofocus on something relatively distant. Um, so that's the thing when using a very wide lens, you can probably get away with quite a, a large aperture because the depth of field is so um, large for such a, a wide-angle lens. Um, then I shall set the two-second timer and... I haven't turned on the bracketing mode. <laughs> uh, so it's on a two second time, I've now set the bracketing to three, plus or minus three stops. So the very bright one looks very bright, and we've got everything in the middle, so that looks all right. I shall just check the focus. Yes, no one's asleep yet. Good. <laughs> um, so it's level. I'm going to start pointing in that direction, and it's set to 8 mil. so take the first set of shots now, and please don't move, because that will make things difficult. <laughs> um, so that's that shot looking in that direction. Then I know it's two clicks, it will take me 90 degrees in this direction. Fortunately, there's no strong shadow, because otherwise you have to sort of press it and run away so that your shadow doesn't get in the shot. Um, so that's the shot looking in that direction. Now in this direction. So you can see how having the, the, the stops, the detents, makes it so much simpler, because you're not having to look at the, the gauge to get the camera pointing the right way. So that should now... It's difficult to see, but I've got three exposures for each position. Um, at 90 degrees. I shall also take a shot looking straight up. And then you do have to sort of duck out of the way a bit. And then take another one looking straight down. Oh, there I do have to get out of the way because <laughs> it's so wide. Um, so I can now see in this picture roughly where the tripod is sitting, so I know what area I need to cover with the patch at the bottom. Some people don't bother putting a, you know, patching over the tripod, they'll just put a big white circle with their logo in the middle or something, but that's, uh, that's not doing things properly. Um, so I just sort of make a mental note of where the tripod is, and then I move over here, and then I can tilt this up so that I'm looking roughly where the tripod was, and take another shot. So, that was the easy part. So now, if I take the card out of there... Get my card reader... Which I did bring, which is very helpful. Um, try not to 
port T in my computer. That's also good. I might borrow a chair so I can do this more comfortably. Um, right. So let's find those images. So basically, I'll be looking for the latest. Um, so that's the the patch shot. That's looking straight up. That's looking straight down. And then there'll be four extra shots there. I'll soon find if that isn't enough. So it's uh, seven shots, three shots each, which is uh, 21, if my math serves me correctly. <laughs> so I'll copy those across first. God, that's already half a gigabyte. <laughs> that's the problem of taking raw photos. Um, That's the, uh, <coughs> the copying sound. Um, so, oh, let me see. So where did I start? Oh no, I've already copied them in the wrong order. Map it. <laughs> so I copied the images I took earlier this evening. Right, let's, let's try and do this a bit more sensibly. Uh, Let's delete one of... I'm going to turn that off because that's just annoying. Uh, so I'll get rid of that. Okay, so that's quite a handy way to view it. So I've got now three columns, and you can see that's the overexposed, that's underexposed, and that's in the middle. So that's the patch shot, which I can see. I can zoom in, actually. That's the patch shot. That's straight down, that's straight up, and then I should have four shots looking around. All right, let's try it again. <laughs> uh, so there, and then we'll have one, two, three, four. Put those in there. Yes, and I don't have much hard drive space left, as always. Um, so I've got those images copied now, so I'll drag them into Lightroom. Uh, import those. And all I'm going to do, which is done by default, is make sure I'm happy with the uh, white balance up here. And then I've automatically got removing the chromatic aberration and you don't actually need to enable the lens undistortion because that's what PT GUI does anyway. Um, but that's fine. So I'm going to export them now. I won't make them very big because otherwise that'll slow the whole process down. Uh, let's go into here, call it processed. Mm, this might take a short while. <laughs> you may talk amongst yourselves whilst it's doing that. Um, someone asked me earlier actually about how I put the virtual tours together. Um, so there's a separate piece of software to PC GUI for that. Um, the one I use is called Pano 2 VR for Panoramas 2. Oh dear, it's crashed. <laughs> Pano, Panorama 2 VR for virtual reality. And it's, it's the environment that you build the tour in, basically. So you can see here, this is the, the tour that I showed you earlier the, of um, the Stay Club in London. At the bottom here, you've got the list of all the different panoramas that I've taken. So this, these at the bottom are the finished, um, completed things that, I've, uh, that have come out of PT GUI. So there are eight of them there. And as you click through, this is where you start choosing where you want things like the hotspots to be. So I don't know how clear it is, but here there's a little blue crosshair. And actually, I can drag that and pull it around wherever I want. If you double click on that, um, no, I don't want to double click on it. I want to click on uh, 
hotspot. No. Oh, there you go. So here you tell it that this hotspot is going to be uh, a linking to another node. Node is another word for panorama. And then you select from the other panoramas you've got loaded what you want to jump to. So as you can see, it's already selected to take you outside. So it's that sort of interface. That's how you, how you build it. Uh, and then the other side of it is the, the interface, or the skin, as they call it. And this is the, the thing that you see that you interact with. So the, the tour will fill the whole screen. I've got the logo up the top here. And you, this is where you put your templates. So the little red feet symbol is there. And that will appear every time there's a hotspot. And then at the bottom here, we've got the, the, the buttons that you interact with. And I've got two versions of that. One for mobile browsers, where for some reason, mobiles don't support the full screen function. So I've got rid of the full screen button at the bottom there, which is this one. Um, anyway, it's now finished processing, so I can stop waffling. Um, so I open PC GUI. It has a little think. And then, so I've got my, I'm going to deselect the patching image for now. So I'm just going to throw the, the remaining 18 images onto here. Um, it automatically detects your uh, lens type from the EXIF data in the pictures. If you don't have that for some reason, you can select what uh, lens and field of view you're using here. Uh, so then you just click align, and it's now told me this project appears to contain six sets of bracketed exposures. So it's noticed and it's understood the fact that I've got a constant ISO, a constant aperture, and that the shutter speeds for each image are the same for each image, if that makes sense. So it's, OK, another way of explaining that is if you look at the source images here, you can see it's going 13th of a second, 100th, 0.6, 13th, 100th, 0.6. And the F stop is the same as is the ISO. So it's recognized that and very helpfully told me do you want me to link these images together? Because what you don't want the software to do is to try and link, is to try and stitch three images that are the same, you know, that were taken looking in the same direction. So, because, you know, they're the same, why does it, it doesn't need to stitch them. So I'm going to select this, which enables the HDR mode, and it links them together. So effectively, it, the stitching side of the software only sees six images, not 18. Um, I'm going to use Exposure Fusion as opposed to HDR because Exposure Fusion is less intense in terms of what the results look like. Um, I use Exposure Fusion in Lightroom as well using a, a, pro, a plugin called LR Infuse for all my architectural photography. So when I'm doing interiors for houses and buildings, I do multiple exposures and then use this plugin called LR Infuse, which is free, uh, sort of donationware. <laughs> Uh, and then that does this blending together in a very natural way. So I should click OK. It's having a quick think. And fingers crossed. Oh, this is, must be the Australian version of the software. <laughs> um, so theoretically, that is a correct stitch of those six images. Um, so what I can then do is I'll grab this side I hold control and then I can flip it upside down and turn this the right way up. <laughs> so that's, we'll go into another a part of it later on where you actually tell it to align the panorama perfectly because, you know, no matter where I let go of this, that is a correct, you know, that's a correct stitch, but obviously we want all the verticals to be lined up. So that's something that we can um, look at later. So I mean, that already gives you an idea of how quickly um, the software works. And if I can sort of drill down and select individual images, and you can see what it's done to the image to make it overlap, um, which is quite extraordinary. So to make those two images overlap, um, 
it's done this weird, you know, pulling corners in all sorts of different directions, and then the ones at the top and bottom look even more peculiar. Um, but that's, you know, in that 10 seconds or however long it took, it's worked out where all the matching features are, and then it's done the distortion for you, so that you end up with something like that. Um, this hasn't done the blending yet, so you've st you've, you can see that you've got a darker line here and then a brighter side. Um, and obviously, you've got the tripod head still here. Um, so the next step is to go into the HDR options and go into the settings here. So this is now doing a, a quick blend. <laughs> Sounds like making coffee or something. Um, so now you can see it's, done a, it's blended all the colors together, so it's looking much better now. And you've got a couple of options you can tweak here that basically affect the, the, the brightness uh, and the shadows and you know, options like that. So that looks about right. I'll reduce the highlights a bit more. Um, good. So that's that. That's looking quite good. Um, I seem to have been cut in half over here. <laughs> um, that's the other thing, um, and in fact, that's a benefit of stitching images in general. If, you've, if you, for whatever reason, have to shoot into the sun and you're looking up, you know, you've got a horrible lens flare, because the lens flare moves as you move the camera, so if the sun is, say, up here and your camera is here, the lens flare sort of goes diagonally across the image. If you move the camera over here, then the uh, lens flare will do that. So, and I've used this technique before, if you have to shoot into the sun and you want to get rid of the lens flare without having to clone it out manually afterwards, just take two images, sort of one like that and one like that, and then because when you throw those images into the into PT GUI, it will notice that, you know, you've over, you, they're almost, the images will maybe completely overlap. But in one image, it'll see a lens flare, and in the other image, it won't. So it will automatically take the good data that is present in both images, if that makes sense. So basically, that means you can automatically get rid of lens flares, which is very helpful if, for whatever reason, you have to shoot looking directly into the sun. That's an aside. So if I happen to be standing in one image and not in the other, then it will ignore me, basically, which is quite clever. Um, I might not drill down into too much detail, but um, basically the way you can tell it to um, make the, the resulting panorama perfectly vertical is in this mode, which is called control points. I can um, actually, I'll just show you briefly so this is what the software has done automatically. So you see the, all these little colored spots here um, and numbers. These are the features which the software has detected. And uh, let me put those the other way around so they're next to each other. So you can see here, sorry to zoom in on, on these people here. <laughs> so you can see it's picked up features across the images, and it's done a very good job of it. Um, and if, for whatever reason, you've had problems with the stitching and there are errors, you can actually manually go in and move these around. And I've had to do that on a couple of um, blends where it's, um, you know, for some reason something's moved. Um, but in this mode, if you select the same image, obviously there are no control points here, you basically click at the top and bottom of something that is vertical in reality, like a door frame. Um, actually, why, not, why don't I do it quickly? So I'm going to click on the top of the door frame there and the bottom of it here. And it's now added a vertical line uh, control point. So I'm just going to do one more of those um, on a different part of the image. Here, so I'm going to click at the top left of that door frame on that side, and then at the bottom here. Now, when I go back to this, um, or rather this, uh, no, sorry, optimizer. Optimizer basically means if you've been fiddling with the control points, you click Run Optimizer, and it will jiggle things around, and that will now have taken account of my 
vertical lines, and as you can see, that's now perfectly vertical. So that's already done a lot of the hard work for me, because before I knew of that option, I had to do that myself. Um, so the next stage will be, uh, let's, let's bring in these, um, these last images here, which should hopefully patch over the tripod automatically. So I'm going to drag those into the list of images here. Uh, I'm going to go into the advanced settings. Um, I'm going to make sure they're linked together. And oh, it's under optimizer and advanced. This is quite an advanced process, and it took me quite a while to get my head around it. Um, let's have a look here. So. Basically, images 18, 19, and 20, which are the last ones, I'm going to call viewpoint um, images. So that tells the software that these weren't taken during the, the rest of the panorama. And then, yeah, if I've remembered the, if I've done this in the right order, um, actually, no, I don't want to do that. I want to optimize it. Hmm. Didn't work, did it? <laughs> um, I shall. <laughs> uh, well, there you go, and that's finished. <laughs> uh, I shall just uh, uh, consult my crib sheet here, because this is such a complicated process that I've um, I made a list of it so that I knew how to do it in the future. Um, I might not go into to this detail because it is quite complicated, but basically, this will end up rotating. The, um, this patch image automatically, and it will cover the, the bottom of the panorama. Did you um, skip importing patch images? I did. Um, so that would be in your endpoint list. Because PTQ hasn't seen them. Yeah. That may have been something to do with it, although I did, uh, I did then optimize it. But let's, let's start from the beginning and align it. Um. Mm. Okay. Um, I also, so it still knows that it's a viewpoint. It says it's very good. Um. Okay. Right. So the easiest way to look straight down is you just tell it to pitch ninety degrees down. So that re jigs everything so that it's um, looking straight down. And then we've ended up with... Mm. I might not... Um, I've obviously done something wrong, and I knew I would. Um, but, yeah, it gives you an idea that ev eventually it will patch over that tripod automatically and it will ignore everything else around it, and you'll end up with a perfectly stitched um, image. But it gives you a feel for the, the flow, and maybe gives you an idea that it's quite complicated, given that I got it wrong. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that's pretty much all I wanted to show you this evening. So unless anyone's got any other questions, um, which I'd be happy to take, um, I won't bore you by trying to get this working. I'll try and get it fi finished, and then I'll send it to you via email. This is a compromise, but um, yeah, does anyone have any other questions? Okay. <laughs> but yeah, that's basically that's where I was going to end the talk, so um, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. I think it's, it's given us quite an insight into, into what is possible uh, with these things. I, I think some of us are saying it's great, you know, we try doing uh, perhaps a simple stitch with landscapes or something like that. Landscapes, as David said, can be very forgiving. Um, when it comes to rooms with <coughs> rectangular pictures on the wall and, and all the rest of it, rather less so. I mean, that's why I'm sure you, you need the level of sophistication that, that, that you've got and some of us maybe will aspire to. Um, so thank you for giving us an insight into all of that. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, 
and uh, thank you for explaining things so clearly as well. I think it's, it's very interesting to know what is out there, even if some of us may feel it's not entirely something we want to pursue. But that level, it's still good to know what's happening out there because you know, the technology is moving on so fast, the software is moving on so fast as well. So, thank you very much once again. Um, Uh, just very briefly, I found uh, a good example of uh, what I mentioned earlier about. Oops, on the wrong screen. Uh, a button. Where's it gone? Come on. There you go. So this was a shot where this was a north-facing property, and as you can see, the sun was up here, and that had a horrible lens flare all across here. And if you just took a single picture, there would be no way around it. But that I took as two slightly separated images stitched together with PT GUI, and it just got rid of the lens flare. So if that is one trick that you've learned this evening, then that's good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>